the first question that you have to ask yourself is why are we seeking legal rights and personhood for non-human animals? And the reason is this. Um, since Roman times, uh, law has been bifurcated essentially into, uh, into, into things on one hand and persons on another hand. Uh, every entity in the world is divided into one of those two categories. If you are a thing, you lack the capacity for any kind of legal right. You're invisible to civil law. Uh, you don't count. The only value that you have is an instrumental value to persons. If you're a person, then you have the capacity for one or a hundred or a, a thousand or a million legal rights. You count in a, in a fundamental way. You're visible to civil law, civil law judges, and the value that the judges assign you is as inherent. You have an inherent value. Uh, in short, you are essentially the master. Persons are masters to the things who are our slaves. Whether that is you know, my water bottle, my computer, or my dog, or a cow. So. The Non-Human Rights Project recognized a long time ago that the fundamental problem, uh, the fundamental obstacle which would, uh, which would prevent us from being able to protect even the most fundamental interests of any non-human animal is that they have been, since Roman times, things. So they're seen as only having instrumental value. They're seen as, as being the slaves to us who are masters. And so we began to to, um, and we, well, we, we also noticed, for example, that Article 6 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that all individuals will be persons. Article 16 of the, um, of the Declaration of Social and Political Rights uh, also says, it guarantees that, that all of us will, will be persons. And there's a reason for that. It's because all legal history tells us that the only way that the most fundamental rights of human beings are protected is if we are persons. So sometimes people tell me, well, why don't you just try to get stiffer animal, wel or, you know, animal welfare statutes passed uh, or have uh, more, uh, have, have uh, yeah, well, that's it, stiffer animal welfare statutes passed rather than try to get rights. And my response to them is, well, why don't you give up all of your rights and we'll try to get some statutes passed that, that protect you and, if, and, if, you're, and if, if, if people don't follow the statutes, there's nothing much you can do about it anyway. So far, I have had no takers. Uh, no one has yet wanted to give up all their rights. And that's exactly why non-human animals need rights. The all legal history, certainly in the West, tells us the only way of protecting even our most fundamental interests of any entity is to make them persons. I have, for decades now, envisioned that this wall exists between persons and, and things. And on the thing side of the wall have always been all the non-human animals of the world, uh, as well as all, all the inanimate objects of the world, of course, the plants of the world. But there, for centuries, there were many, there were millions and millions of human beings were also things, uh, slaves, sometimes women, children, those who were developmentally disabled in some way, uh, might have been things at, at some periods. Um, and indeed, a, a great deal of the civil rights work over the last centuries has been to move, uh, one at a time, all these humans who are things from the thing side of that wall over to the person side of that wall. And when we go in front of a, of, of a court, we oftentimes encounter and expect to encounter uh, judges who believe that that being a, 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 a that being a person and being usually the first person doesn't leave until 15 minutes after I start speaking. So this was unusually quick. So, so uh, usually, uh, oftentimes judges will 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 just intuitively believe and grossly wrongly believe that human and person are synonyms. That all humans are persons and all persons are humans. And so even though. Legal history says, no, that is not true. In fact, the law today says that is not true. It's still something that they intuitively believe, just as if you stop someone on the street of Berlin, you will find that a very large percentage of them sometimes, somehow intuitively think that, a syn that humans and persons are synonyms. Uh, that assumes that you have persons, that, that there's a, a, uh, 
uh, a German word for persons. I think I just had a German student in my class who were having a discussion about that. Uh, anyway, persons generally throughout, throughout the West mean those entities who have the capacity uh, indeed for, for rights. Now on the other side of that wall, um, currently are all human beings. Remember, I've, I've talked about the fact that, that uh, uh, for centuries many human beings were on the thing side of the wall. In fact, uh, there's, there's a case in, in London there, in 1772 called Somerset versus Stuart, where a black slave, uh, for the first time, was, was said to be, to be a, a, a person and, and was freed because Lord Mansfield, who was Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench at that time, said that slavery was so odious that the common law, which in England was a common law country, uh, would, would not support it. And that really began uh, the, the, the process of, 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 of moving slaves um, over uh, to, from the, from the uh, thing side to the person side. And I wrote a book about it called Though the Heavens May Fall. And the reason I wrote that book is I intended to model the litigation of the non-human rights project on behalf of non-human animals on the litigation that was done on behalf of James Somerset in the Court of, King Bench, of, Court of King's Bench in 1772. So they too brought common law, sought common law writs of habeas corpus on behalf of James Somerset. And we indeed bring common law writs of habeas corpus on behalf of non-human animals. And I'll, for those who don't understand what those are, any of those terms, I will explain them in due course. <laughs> So, uh, so on the person side as well, while all human beings are now persons, you know, as I said, for centuries, we try to explain this to judges, for centuries we've been bringing persons over from the, from the, side of, of, from the thing side. So what we try to explain to judges is that just because all non-human animals are things today and all humans are persons, that doesn't mean that's always been that way. In fact, it hasn't always been that way. And that what you're looking at is a specific step in a process. And the process has been bringing things over to the person side. And uh, so, right, so don't get fooled and somehow think it's always been that way. And now we're simply taking the next step and beginning to bring species of non-human animals also over from the thing side over to the, to the person side. And as well, uh, uh, there, are, there have been many non-human entities who are persons. So corporations are persons, probably the city of Berlin is a person, Germany is probably a person, meaning they have the capacity for legal rights. So within the last few years, uh, New Zealand, for example, has made the Wanganui River a person, a national park a person. Uh, two months ago, the Colombian Supreme Court made the Amazon rainforest a person. And, and literally a person, meaning the Amazon rainforest or the Wanganui River or the National Park in New Zealand has legal rights. They, or they, at least they have the capacity for them and they give them to them uh, as well. Now, sometimes I use an example. I just want to make sure that people understand what person is. Since judges often don't understand what persons are, if you're not a judge, you, you know, I don't blame you for not understanding as well. So let me just do a little thing, just to make sure you understand. So if all the droplets in this, you know, each droplet is a, is a legal right of any kind. So if I just pour all the legal rights on the floor, it can't be said that anyone actually has them. So you have to have, you have, to have a container of rights in order to have the rights. And once you're a rights container, you can then begin having rights. So a rights container is another name for a person. A person is, by definition, a container of rights, that, or, or has the capacity to contain rights. So it's theoretically possible that you could be said to be a person without having any rights, though I've never heard of that. In theory, it's possible, though I doubt it will ever happen in practice. So what the Non-Human Rights, rights Project does is work to have judges recognize that that our non-human animal clients, and so far they've been chimpanzees and elephants, are rights containers, are legal persons. And the first right that we ask that they, that they have is the right to bodily liberty, to be able to move about freely, not be held in captivity, that is protected by a common law writ, writ of habeas corpus. In 1985, uh, 
I realize that, uh, that, that I realize what the answer is. Now, how are we going to, to begin getting courts to, to agree with us and begin protecting non-human animals by making them le legal persons? So, first of all, we have to come up with one, a reason why we should. So I actually spend, uh, I spend the next seven years just reading and trying to understand what rights are, where rights come from, what's the history of rights, who hasn't had rights, you know, who got rights, and beginning with, uh, with David to try to, to figure out um, you know, where rights could possibly come from uh, and you know, what, what they were so we could begin to, to, to understand which non-human animals might be able to get rights and also to begin to understand what the process was of those humans who didn't have rights and how did they then get rights. Uh, so that was uh, so because we wanted to replicate that, that process to, if, if we could. So, so we, we had to begin to, to um, come up with, with, with legal theories and then we had to begin to, once we came up with them, and we're still coming up with them um, in, in the Non-Human Rights Project, is to then beginning, begin to disseminate them amongst our brother and sister lawyers and judges and law professors uh, you know, the, in, we, you know, inside of our profession. And I began to publish a series of, of law review articles intending them as a way of communicating with judges and lawyers and professors. Um, uh, after a while, I realized that nobody was reading law review articles, uh, or at least they weren't reading mine, and that I wasn't really communicating with, with anybody. So I decided that uh, I needed to, uh, to write in a much less technical way and to write, start writing trade books. And so that's what I, be, I, I did in the, in the, in the um, middle of the, of the 1990s. I found a sympathetic editor in Boston who believed in what I was doing, and, uh, and I began writing a series of, of, of trade books. And one of the first ones that came out in 2000 was Rattling the Cage Toward Legal Rights for Animals, which really set out you know, a very large number of the theories that, that, uh, that I believed were applicable in 2000, and in 2018, we, we, use, all, we, we use all the time. So the second thing is that we had to begin to teach students and, and get some, some kind of academic respectability about the discipline. In other words, we had to, had to invent it. Uh, uh, and so I began teaching something I then called animal rights law, which I now call animal rights jurisprudence. And I taught, and in, in 1985, I sent a letter to the, I was living in Boston, I sent a letter, I think, to the seven law schools in Boston saying I wanted to teach animal rights law. So uh, after six months, uh, I had not heard anything back, and so I, I took that as a no, and I began trying to figure out how I might be able to teach somewhere else. And five years later, the Vermont Law School in 1990 asked me to teach a course that I called animal rights law. And then in ten, 10 years later, I was asked to teach the first class in Harvard Law School, which I, I taught on an animal rights law. Uh, last year, I taught at Stanford Law School, animal rights jurisprudence. Uh, so you know, in, in the United States, uh, there are now, I think, 140 or so law schools in which people s teach some version, usually of animal protection, of animal uh, welfare, and they throw some of some of the rights things in. You know, my class now that I teach at, at the Lewis and Clark Law School in the master's program there is, in to is totally rights. Uh, we, I don't talk about animal welfare issues or animal protection issues. I, I talk, we talk only about uh, legal personhood and the history of rights and how, how non-human animals might be able to achieve legal rights. It was clear to me that this was a gigantic enterprise. I certainly was not going to be able to, to do it by, by myself. So in 1996, I began an organization that later took on the name the Non-Human Rights Project, which was essentially me until 2007. And then I began to bring others in. Uh, who, and I, at one point, I was, I was a volunteer for 17 years in the Non-Human Rights Project. And I was supervising, at one point, 70 other volunteers until I started going insane. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and then, eventually, money began coming in enough so I could begin hiring people. So now, the Non-Human Rights Project, you know, has has a, has a, has a growing staff. Uh, so yeah, so I, I I needed to do that. So the first thing that we had to think about was what 
what cause of action could we use? In other words, when a lawyer, when, when someone files a lawsuit, a lawyer has to claim that something has been done that's not legal. And generally, uh, lawyers and, 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 and judges and professors have these, kind of, these boxes that you kind of tick off. You know, uh, did someone, is someone claiming there's been a breach of contract? Is someone claiming that someone negligently you know, ran me over? Did, you know, did someone violate my rights you know, through a labor union? All of these th things that were taught in, in law school, you know, where is, is, there, is there a challenge to a will? What about a trust? These sorts of things. So we had to come up with some kind of a legal theory that was, we hope, something that the judges would, judges would be familiar with. And the idea that, that we're looking for something that judges would be familiar with is something that runs through all the work we do. We understand that no matter what we claim, when the first time we walk in front of a judge, that judge will not have, will not have heard of what we do and not have heard of us, and that was true in 2013. In 2018, they often know we're coming. We're like, the, you know, when we file a lawsuit, like, and, and we go into court, like, the galleries are filled with, with court clerks and everyone who want to see, you know, what, what's going on. We become famous every time we, we file something, but, but, we, but they still have to, the, 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 the human mind is a categorizing machine, so they, they need to understand what kind of box are we asking them to tick off. So that was really one of the first things I had to do. And the box that I chose was the common law writ of habeas corpus. Let me talk about the habeas corpus part and then I'll talk about the common law. I guess my question is what happens if someone just kidnaps me and keeping me in their house and so my wife says, uh, I would like to file a lawsuit and have that person come in and explain why they can keep my husband in the house. That's called a writ of habeas corpus under, under English law and Argentina law Argent and other, other places where I, li I litigate or I, I, I speak with, with people, they have either habeas corpus Argent or something that sounds like it. So, um, uh, so what happens then, um, it's, it, it's, it's Latin for you have the body and it means somebody has the body. And so uh, someone is detained, now the, the, someone is, is detained and, and it, crucially it's a person is detained against her will. Those are the only two things you have to show. Judge, there's a person I know of detained against her will. Now, until, until we started litigating, the only persons who had ever been detained had been human beings. So you can imagine that judges are saying, what, you know, they, it's a chimpanzee? Uh, and uh, then the question is, is that chimpanzee a person? Which is where, where our, our arguments start cropping up. But first we'll argue that they have been detained against their will. Now, that doesn't happen very often, that people are just detained against their will. In fact, we rely to a large degree upon cases uh, involving black slaves in the United States and in England and other places who would challenge the legality of their slavery by saying that they're being detained against their will. They, they, shouldn't, they, they can't be a slave. That's in exactly what James Somerset's lawyers did. They said, James Somerset, um, James Somerset was, was a slave who had been kidnapped from West Africa when he was eight years old. And he was a slave of a, of a Scottish businessman named Charles Stewart uh, who, who bought him in Virginia. And then, travel, and then Somerset came, uh, James Somerset traveled with him for the next 20 years throughout uh, the American colonies until he brought him to, to England. And there James Somerset had decided eventually he was going to escape. And then when he did, he, uh, Charles Stewart then hired slave catchers to find him in London, and then Somerset was then brought, was, was captured, and then not brought back to Charles Stewart, but was, was chained to the deck of a ship called the Annan Mary, which was then set to sail to Jamaica, where he would be uh, sold in the, in the markets, and he'd have to harvest sugar cane for the three to five years that he had to live before he was to die of, of, of overwork. So when that happened, Three people, probably his godparents, but I don't know for sure, it may not have been, went to Lord Mansfield, who was the Chief Justice of the Court of King's Bench, and asked that he issue a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of James Somerset, claiming that James Somerset was a, crucially, was a person who was being detained against his will. Now, it was clear that James Somerset was being detained against his will. What was not clear was whether he was a person, and that really was, was what happened. That, you know, that was what the case was about. So I've thought of that many times because I too 
you know, based, basing our case on the Somerset case, which most judges have never even heard of in, in the United States until we start talking to them about it. Um, so I know when I go in front of a judge and demand that our client, who might be a chimpanzee or might be an elephant, uh, is also being detained against their will. And then I, I, I imagine what Lord Mansfield was facing when he had to decide, am I going to issue the writ of habeas corpus? Knowing that things cannot get a, a, a writ of habeas corpus, only persons can. Remembering again that a thing is simply a, a, ter, a legal term of art for an entity not who does not have the capacity for legal rights as opposed to a person who does have the capacity for legal rights. And so I, I was never sure, even though I spent three years researching every aspect of the case, but I, I never was sure whether Lord Mansfield did this, but I think he had to have, which, because when he was confronted with that issue, should I issue the writ of habeas corpus, he was essentially, he was only going to do it if he thought that there was some possibility, some argument, something that could be made to him that would cause him to believe that a black slave was a person. Because if he didn't think that it was even theoretically possible under any circumstance, he, he wouldn't issue the writ of habeas corpus, I don't think. So for example, within the Non-Human Rights Project, we talk about that, that issue. Um, if we go in on behalf of an elephant, say, uh, is, is that the exact, it, it, and, and ask that the judge believe or accept the idea that there are some arguments that we could make or some facts that we could present to the judge that will cause her to agree that the elephant is, is, is a person. We believe that that's our job, to be able to, to persuade the, the, the judge at the beginning. So, for example, if we come in with, with a computer, or we come, let me say, we come in with a pencil, we say, we're here representing this pencil, and who is being held against its will, and we want you to issue a writ of habeas corpus, we think that the judge will not do that. And will do it, not do it immediately, because we think the judge will not imagine that there's any possible arguments or facts that could be brought before her that would persuade her that a pencil could be a person. So our job then is to persuade the judge that we, you know, we're putting all these, we'll put all these facts by experts in front of her. We have these long legal arguments, and we're saying, look, you don't have to buy them right now. But we think that we've at least made a prima facie case that an elephant could be a person, or a chimpanzee, or a whale, or whoever could be a person. And uh, we would like you to issue the writ of habeas corpus and then hold hearings to decide whether or not our client, our client is. Now, in 2015, I'll talk about it a little later, Justice Barbara Jaffe of the, of the, of in, in the Supreme Court, which in New York is the lowest court, um, of, of, uh, in Manhattan, became the first judge to issue a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of, of a, of a non-human animal in, in legal history, which was our client, uh, our clients, Her Hercules and Leo. Uh, later on, th there is an HBO, Arte, you have uh, Arte, HBO, Arte, BBC4, a film that was made about us called Unlocking the Cage, and um, which, by the way, was nominated for an Emmy two days ago for Best Social Justice Documentary, um, we shall see. Um, because it's, it's being shown on HBO as well as on Arte as well as on uh, B BBC4. Uh, so in that film, uh, the filmmakers were able to get their cameras into the courtroom to film this you know, extraordinary event, uh, the, the hearing that occurred. And you'll see that Justice Jaffe begins the hearing on whether or not Hercules and Leo should be released pursuant to a writ of habeas corpus by saying, I brought us here in order to be able to have both sides make their arguments to me. And that was exactly what we wanted her to do, and that's what we think Judge Lord Mansfield in 1772 had wanted to do as well. So whenever we go in front of a judge, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to persuade that judge from the onset to issue the writ of habeas corpus in order to give both sides a chance to really start fighting about it in, in court. Um, you know, our job is to, we pick fights. Uh, be, and so, you know, so we, we try to provoke fights, we try to pick fights, and we try to win our fights. Uh, so that's just, that's just what being a lawyer uh, is about. You know, the, no one's about to give anything to non-human animals, much less personhood. You know, we have to fight every step of the way, and we're all ready to do that. In fact, we're looking for a fight. So 
That's, that's what we do. We try to persuade the judges they should at least take the first step of issuing the writ of habeas corpus. And the writ of habeas corpus is simply a piece of paper that, that, that we then serve on the entity who is holding our client, whether it's chimpanzee so far or an elephant, and say, you have to come into court and you have to give a reason, a legally sufficient reason, why you are holding our chimpanzee or elephant client captive. And that's what, that's what the hearings are, are about. So, so it's not only a writ of, so it, it, it's a writ of habeas corpus, but there are different kinds of writs of habeas corpus. And the particular kind that we use is, is, is a common law writ of habeas corpus. So we decided uh, uh, not to um, file law, lawsuits under, under statutory habeas corpus, habeas corpus statutes, under habeas corpus that was, that was codified in statutes, or under a constitution, or under an international treaty. And here's the reason why. We believe that, that, if, that a judge who was interpreting a statute would likely believe that when the statute was enacted, it was not, when they use the word person, it was not meant to cover our client. It was meant to cover only human beings. But the common law is the law that judges make. So what we say is we, and, and so, so we use a common law writ of habeas corpus, which is, a, which is the, the law of habeas corpus that the judges themselves have made over the centuries. So we then say to the judge, you know, you're the ones who make the law of habeas corpus, and you can change the law of habeas corpus, and you don't need to look to, to see what other th party, say the legislature, meant. You know, in fact, a common law judges have a responsibility to keep the law current as scientific evidence changes, as public morality changes, as public policy changes, uh, as, hu as human experience changes. Judges are supposed to, to keep the common law current. They're not supposed to, they don't wait for legislators to act. They may never act. So the judges themselves will step in and do that. So that's why we use a common law writ of habeas corpus, because we say, look, and we understand the common law began uh, developing in the 13th century, uh, and it's been around for you know, 700 years, uh, and, but, but now is the time to, to extend it past human beings. As, as just as you have extended it to uh, now to all human beings. And don't bother looking at somewhere else. Don't look at the legislatures. Judges know, I think to some degree, what we're, what we're doing. And they oftentimes, if you see the film, um, you know, I, I think you'll see some judges saying, well, why don't you go to the legislature? And we say, we could go to the legislature, but we don't want to. We want you to do what we want you to do. So let's go. Um, so we don't want... Uh, we, 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 don't, we don't know how to get a statute passed. Getting, we, our arguments are made from justice, and we argue to the judges that their job is solely to dispense justice. Now, another thing about habeas corpus is that uh, it's a cause of action that is unique in, in Anglo-American law um, for many reasons. Uh, one of them is that um, it's called, it, or it's almost unique, it's called a summary writ, which means that uh, when you file a, a lawsuit, um, everything happens very quickly, or supposed to. And because that's because habeas corpus is meant to, to free someone who's being held against their will. So judges move it right along. I mean, I mean you, you, sometimes within 24 hours, you're in court. 48 hours, you're in court. If I file a regular lawsuit, I'll be in court maybe in two years from now. Uh, who knows? Uh, plus, we'd have to engage in discovery, interrogatories, and, and depositions. I don't know if you have that in, in Germany or not, but it, it's expensive. It, 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 uh, it, it, it takes a long time. So if we're going to lose, we want to lose immediately. We don't want to lose like two years from now. And, and, we, and we don't particularly care whether we win or lose and when, when we file a, a, a lawsuit because that's just at the trial level. We're interested in having this go to the high court and have them say, non-human animals are, are legal persons. In fact, we're concerned sometimes, so far it hasn't happened, that we might win. Because if we win, then the other side didn't appeal, then we'd never be able to get to a high court. So, but don't worry, we haven't worried about that. So far we've lost every single time. Um, but it's not, it hasn't been that grim, but I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. So, um, uh, 
that's one thing. Another thing is there's something, I don't know in German law, if they have it as well, probably. Uh, in English, uh, Anglo-American law, there's something called res judicata, which means the thing is settled. So if you and I have a contract, and I say that you breach the contract, uh, I can sue you and, and say I lose. Well, then I'll say, well, let me try again. I'll sue you again. I lose, I'll just sue you again. You, you can't do that. You, can only, you only have one try. And after that, the second time you try, the defendant will put up the defense of what we call it, res judicata, which the thing is settled. Go away. We don't want to hear any more. You've, you've already lost. Habeas corpus does not ha is not bound by a res judicata for all kinds of historical reasons. You can generally keep filing lawsuits. Um, and we understood that the, I the odds of us winning early on in these lawsuits were, not, were, were, were small. After all, the law has been, going, been this way for 2,000 years. The judges have never heard of anything except this. All of a sudden, we kind of parachute in their court when we come out of nowhere saying that, they, that chimpanzees ought to have rights. Judges, you know, the idea that a judge would say, wow, we have been wrong these 2,000 years. I can't believe we were so stupid. Of course you'll have rights. That's not likely to happen. And we understood that. So we figured that judges are like other people are going to have to hear something two times, five times, 10 times, 20 times, and not just for us. But we're also very concerned about what goes on outside the courtroom because judges are citizens as well. And they have spouses and children and grandchildren and everyone's talking. So we, underst we understand that the struggle we're in is, is as much political as it is legal. And that the better we do outside of the courtroom, the better, better we're likely to do inside the courtroom because judges don't want to feel that they're doing something really strange. That, that they want to know that they're moving, that moving within the kind of the stream of at least legal thought and if they can, public thought. We generally think that judges don't get, want to get either too far ahead of the public opinion or too far behind of the public opinion. But they have room to maneuver. And sometimes, occasionally, judges will. But it's, it, it's not all that often. So we, want, we, we, we try not to have that happen. Um, now, another thing, so I was talking about, um, uh, the, about habeas corpus. Why well, I, I think I've, I've hit at least some of the, of, the, of the good reasons that we use habeas corpus. Uh, as I think, the, I'll, I'll probably think of more because there are more reasons that we use a writ of habeas corpus. Now also, when we're going into a, a court, generally, um, what we do, now oh, you have to understand as well, likely Germany has a German law. Uh, the United States, we have, we have a federal United States law, but also each of the 50 states is an independent sovereign in important ways. So the law of New York and the law of California are very different from each other and they're not standardized anywhere. So we can, we can litigate then you know, in 50 states. We can fight. And so we, we try to make, it took us seven years to try to figure out which states we were going to litigate in. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why later why we, we, why we went to the state of New York. Uh, so, but what we do wherever we go is that we tried, we try, oh, this is actually part of, uh, of not wanting judges, uh, 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 beginning to try to um, educate judges and not having them feel that they're going to be cut out, they're going to be off on a limb and they're going to look silly if they roll in, 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 in our favor. So what we do is we read hundreds and hundreds of judicial decisions and we see what, what values and principles do the judges say that they value. Once we understand what the judges themselves say they value, then we frame our legal arguments in terms of what the judges already say that they value. So in, in New York and probably you know, other places too, for example, uh, we find that, that judges um, value the idea of liberty. They value the idea of equality. They value the idea of the importance of autonomy. So let me give you an example. Liberty and equality probably don't surprise you because they're valued all over the West. But, and, but so is autonomy. So we find, for example, in the state of New York, but other states as well, and likely Germany, but I don't know, say you have a, um, an adult, a competent adult, who's in a hospital. And the doctors say, if you don't have certain kinds of surgery or you don't take certain kinds of medication, you're, you know, are the, are the patient's going to die. You're going to die. And you say, I'd rather die. I don't want that surgery. I don't want that kind of medication. I want to die. So 
there are cases in which then the hospital went to the courts in New York and said, this is the problem, we want you to override the autonomy of the sick person and allow us to violate her autonomy and, f and give her surgery against her will or force her to take medications against her will. The courts say, no, we're not going to do that, that we value her autonomy more than we value her life. And if she wishes to die, then we're going to let her die. So when we read cases like that, we conclude that the courts of New York you know, supremely value autonomy because they value it even more than they value the life of the citizen. So at the very least, it's a really important value. So we, d we decided that the first non-human animals that we're going to have as our clients are ones who we can prove are autonomous. And we argue that autonomy is a sufficient but not a necessary reason for us for, for, for having rights. So that's something that many people don't understand. We get criticized for it. They think that we're just filing lawsuits on behalf of these incredibly and co cognitively complex beings. And we don't care about any of the others. That's not true. We don't, we, we are, because there may be many, many, uh, other, many non-human animals who are not autonomous. We, we simply fi are filing suit on behalf of autonomous beings because we believe that judges highly value autonomy. So we, that's part of what we do. We try to frame our lawsuits in terms of the values that judges say they already believe in. Because we're already asking them to transgress one belief, which is that only humans have rights. So we try to not to make them feel uncomfortable with any other part of our lawsuit so that we can all just focus on this one thing, should uh, our, our client have rights, rather than, than trying to persuade them that they should have other kinds of values. So we then filed suit on, on behalf of chimpanzees. So we, we could have filed suit on behalf of, of any non-human animal, but first we decided that we would do it on behalf of autonomous beings. So we had to go out and talk to the, speak to the scientists because when lawyers file lawsuits, you know, part of it is, is, is legal. We have to persuade judges that the law ought to be the way we're saying it is. If the facts are a certain way, we should win because the law would say we win. Then we have to make sure that we can present the facts to the judge that will harmonize with the law and, and allow us to win. So we've already now figured out what our, our legal arguments are. Now we're trying, we're, and, and we're saying that, that autonomy it ought to be a sufficient reason for, for uh, gaining rights, and especially the kind of rights that, are, that, that protect autonomy, such as a writ of habeas corpus. Because when someone's being held against their will, what's really happening is their autonomy is being grossly violated. They can't move around. So autonomy fits in very well with a writ of habeas corpus. So, we then go to the scientists of the world who have spent their whole lives studying chimpanzees. And we did it again with elephants, and we're doing it again with orcas because we're looking at SeaWorld in San Diego. And so, so we spent, you know, I'd spent years traveling around the world, you know, meeting these people. And Jane Goodall is a member of my board of directors. I've known Jane for 25 years now, uh, and other ones. So we ended up finding um, Christoph Busch in Switzerland, um, uh, we, so we ended up bringing in, they, they agreed to do it, uh, uh, chimpanzee experts in Japan, in Sweden. Um, Christoph is, uh, is he, he's either German or Swiss, or Swiss-German. Uh, uh, scientists in, in Scotland, you know, in, in England, in the United States. All, we thought, the greatest cognitive, you know, chimpanzee cognitive uh, uh, scientists in the world who'd spent their whole lives, sometimes 40, 50 years, you know, studying the cognition and the behavior of chimpanzees. And we asked them to write affidavits that focused on the issue of autonomy. Why are chimpanzees autonomous? And, and it took us, you know, some time to collect them, but we got them, and so we then, we, we would then file them with the court. So now you know why uh, we're bringing a common law writ of habeas corpus you know, on, on behalf of chimpanzees. And the reason we do it in the state of New York is because they do, val they, they, they do value things that we can, that, that we can um, um, use to speak to them, or let's see, we can use to create a case in terms of those values. 
So they, things like they believe in liberty. We have liberty arguments. They believe in equality. We have equality arguments. They see the value of autonomy. We have lots and lots of the best experts in the world demonstrating that, that chimpanzees are autonomous. You know, they believe in habeas corpus. They believe in, in, in other things that we kind of tick off and say, okay, now we understand what you believe in New York and our case is going to be crafted so that everything that we argue, we're hoping that it's going to harmonize with what you've always said or what you say that you believe in. We had, we had, once we had decided that we wanted to file suit on behalf of chimpanzees, we did the opposite of what lawyers do. Usually lawyers just sit in their office and somebody comes in and they have a problem and you file suit in that, in, in that state. Or that. What we did is find the state that we wanted to file suit in and then we wanted to find our clients. So we had now said we want to file suit in New York. Now who should we file suit on behalf of? So we looked at elephants, we looked at gorillas, we looked at chimpanzees, and we finally decided to file suit on behalf of two chimpanzees who are being kept in a roadside zoo in the Catskill Mountains uh, named Merlin and Reba. Then next month, after we decided to do that, I went to that roadside zoo, I paid my money, and we saw that, uh, that uh, Reba had, had died while we were deciding we were going to file the first lawsuit on her behalf. So we decided that we would file suit on behalf of Merlin, and you can see Merlin. In the film, he's a very depressed looking chimpanzee because the only companion he has had for a long time is now dead. So he's by himself now. And chimpanzees are as social as you are, you and I are, in fact, maybe even more. And so then what happens is we're gonna, we decided we're filing suit the first week of December 2013. In September, I send my executive director back. You can see all this on the film too. Remember, in the film, we don't know how everything's going to turn out. So you're watching what's going on with our filmmakers hoping that they haven't invested all these years and nothing's going to happen. So, uh, or that, you know, we'd all die or whatever. So, so there, uh, so then we, we learned that there's no, there's no chimpanzees there. We learned that Merlin had died the night before. People didn't really know how to take care of him and he, he died of, a, of an, really, a, of, of an abscessed tooth that the, that the human doctor didn't know how much uh, anesthesia to give him and killed him. Uh, and so, what, what happened then is we decided that we would try to identify and file suit on behalf of every chimpanzee we could identify in the state of New York. Uh, so that's, we identified two, four, five. We identified five chimpanzees in the state of New York. Now, five more. So those would, would be the, the, the chimpanzees we would file suit on, although we filed suit on behalf of four because one of them would die before, in the next eight weeks before we, we, could, we could file suit. So what happened is that you'll see on film we, we wanted to make sure that they were actually there because they were just kind of rumors and that we would see on the internet that there were chimpanzees there. And so one of them, you'll see Tommy, how we, how we find Tommy we, and we're able to get onto the property. It's, people are selling used trailers on a used trailer lot. That Tommy's being kept in a cage in a warehouse like structure on a place selling used trailers. Uh, so we were, you can see how we're able to, to get in and, and, and realize he's there. Uh, we think there are two other chimpanzees being held in a storefront in Niagara Falls, uh, in, in, in a house. And uh, you can see what happens when we go there and, uh, and how we pretty much, you know, we don't ask to see them, but through the conversations, we're pretty, we're pretty um, persuaded that indeed uh, the chimpanzees are, you know, are, are in there. And then we uh, try to find Hercules and Leo who are being kept with this, these horrible medical experiments um, not even for health purposes. There, uh, people, uh, professors of anatomy, you know, took these two little guys away at the age of two, and now I think they're seven, and they've kept them in a cage in, in the basement of a computer laboratory and made them undergo uh, general anesthesia on, about once a month and put, uh, they, 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 wanna, they, they wanna see how chimpanzees, why do chimpanzees walk with bent legs and, as opposed to humans who walk with straight legs? Now, it's not that, you know, I don't hate science. I actually have a degree in chemistry before I, I went to law school. I, I, I got a degree in chemistry, so I'm, I don't hate science, but I hate using science without any kind of boundaries. And that's what they were doing. They were, as far as I was concerned, they were tor torturing these two little, you know, like ape children from the age of two to the age of seven um, before we could get at them and before we really understood them. And they, they by the way, people denied it. We, we actually filed our lawsuits without ever knowing that Hercules and Leo were there. We finally had deep, like a deep inside information that 
somebody was 95% sure that they were there. So we filed suit based on our belief that it was overwhelming possibility that they were there, but we had never spoken to anyone who had actually ever seen them. As soon as we filed the lawsuit, Stony Brook University had to admit that they were there, and that was, that was great. So what we then do is begin filing in December, our, we begin seeking our writs of habeas corpus. And so you can imagine when we walk into a courtroom and we say we have like a, a petition for habeas corpus and we have 100 pages of affidavits and we have a 90-page you know, memo, so we have... And also in Europe, you guys, when you have like an affidavit, you like stamp it and you put like ribbons on it and it's like all sorts of things that we don't do in the United States for official papers. So, you know, those are flapping all over the place and people are wondering, you know, exactly what are we doing? So we go in and we say, well, you know, we're seeking a red habeas corpus. I have this chimpanzee. Named, so that was Tommy. That was the first one we did. And they, they, didn't, they sent us off to some place that was, it was so in, much in the woods that you couldn't hardly see the courthouse. Uh, it was a very rural courthouse. And the judge, when he finally shows up, uh, just has us come into the courtroom to talk about this and without reading any of our papers. And he's a really nice guy. And, and by the way, everything we argue, whenever there's a stenographer, there's a transcript, everything that we do always goes up on our website. Whether they think we're great, whether they think we're stupid, whether we win, whether we lose, whatever, everything goes up on the website. So, it's, so someone can, you can follow uh, you know, what our arguments were, what was going on in court, and of course some of it is actually uh, in, in, the, in the film. So the, that story, long story short is that the judge says, wow, this is terrible. I'm going to do everything I can to help Tommy uh, except issue a writ of habeas corpus. And so we said, well, if we thought there was something else you could do, we'd ask you to do that. But there is nothing because what they're doing to Tommy is perfectly legal. But we're saying it still violates his fundamental right to bodily liberty protected by a writ of habeas corpus. So uh, the judge then says, well, you lose. We say, great. We'll be back to the higher court. Then we all pile on the car and we go, to, uh, we go to Niagara Falls and we do it again the next day. And that judge says, give me a week to read all this stuff. We say, fine. So we have a hearing a week later and he lets, you know, he lets us argue. And he's like totally honest with this. He says, I, and you can see it on the transcript, I'm not going to be the first judge to take, make this leap of faith. You know, I don't want to do this. There's some judges who want to have their picture on the front page of every newspaper in the, United, in the world, and there's some judges who don't. He was one of those who don't, who, you know, who does not want to do that. And we're looking for someone who's willing to do that, to, to become famous for, you know, for, for doing that. Um, so when they die, the obituary would say, they were the first person to do this. Um, that was not him. So then we... We go, to, we fly to, um, but by the way, the, the, the statute under which we, and the common law under which we filed, uh, did not even require that the judge give us a hearing. We frankly didn't expect ever to see a judge. So we were greatly encouraged that the judges were interested enough to at least see us face to face and talk about it. So then we fly to, um, to where Stony Brook is, and that, then, that's exactly what happens. That judge could run me over in his car and I would never know because I, we never saw him. The papers went in, and then, they, and then they came out saying, you know, get out of here. So we did. We got out of there. And um, then we began the process of going up to the appellate courts, cause, which is where we really wanted to be. So New York has a whole bunch, you know, hundreds of local courts, but then the state of New York is divided into four districts, cleverly called the first, second, third, and fourth district. And those are intermediate appellate courts. And then those four intermediate appellate courts all feed into one court, which is called the Court of Appeals. Ideally, we'd like to have to win in the Court of Appeals. That's what, that's what we're aiming for. But first, we have to get through the intermediate appellate courts. Now, it's important to know that we have a right to appeal to the intermediate appellate courts, but we do not have a right to appeal to the high court. That, that court only takes about 3% of the, of the cases that, were, that are appealed to it. So, whatever happens at the intermediate appellate court is likely the end of the case. You can ask, but the you only have about a 3% chance of having the judges hear your case. And if you do, that doesn't mean you're going to win. So we begin the process of going to intermediate appellate courts. And then we start seeing the confusion that occurs with the judges. 
And that confusion uh, is going on to this day. So the first, we, we, we appeal Hercules and Leo to the, to the court. And as soon as we do that, the, the court says, uh, you lose. And we say, you know, don't we get to file briefs or argue or anything like everyone else? And they, no, you lose because you don't have the right to appeal. Of course, we know, I just told you we do. We do. But they decide that we don't have, they, I guess they so much don't want to hear our case that they try to make us go away by saying they don't have a right, to, we don't have a right to appeal. But remember, we can file a writ of habeas corpus somewhere else. Oh, that's another reason. You can, uh, you can file writs of habeas corpus near, wherever you want. So you don't have to file in any particular court. You can keep filing in different courts. So we decided, you know, we know when we're not wanted, so we're going to file it, you know, the case somewhere, somewhere else. Plus, we don't want to spend two years litigating that issue when we can just file somewhere else. So that's what happens with that, with Hercules and Leo's case. Then we go into Tommy's appeal. Tommy's appeal goes down to this struggle over whether or not to be a person you have to have the capacity to have rights and duties. In other words, you have to be able to assume duties in order to have rights, or rights or duties. So if you can, if you can assume either right, if you can have, assume duties or have rights, then you're a person. That's really the fight. We argue that every case in the history of at least certainly Anglo-American law has said if you can have the capacity for rights or duties, you are a person. And we end up losing because the court says, no, you have to have rights and duties. And we say, where do, where do you get that? And where they got it was primarily from a, something called Black's Law Dictionary, which you probably don't even use in, in here. But it's a, a dictionary that lawyers use to, to define words. So they go to Black, and person, so they, they say, look, person says, in order to be able to be a person, you have to, you have to be able to have rights and duties. And we say, what? And, we look, and they, they cite a single source for that, which is in 1920, the, the ninth edition of a legal scholar that was published in 1929. It takes us a long time to find that book in the, in, in the, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And we find it. It says your person, if you have, can have the kinds of rights or duties. And so we write an email to the editor who writes the dictionary and saying, you're screwing up our cases because you got, the, you got the, the definition of person backwards. And three hours later, he says, whoops, you know, my bad. And we say, yeah, except we lost. And he said, well, the next edition will put in the right definition of person. But we've now lost the case you know, for, for that reason. So, so then what we do, for the, then we file, we file our, our lawsuit. We go back to Manhattan now and file another lawsuit on behalf of Hercules and Leo. And because we're suing Stony Brook University, the Attorney General of New York is representing Stony Brook University because it's a state university. And that is where the first time Justice Jaffe issues the writ of habeas corpus, which you can watch her do it on, on the film. And then we have a hearing, which you can also see parts of that on, on, on the film. So Justice Jaffe then writes a long opinion in which she agrees with everything we say, but she does not, uh, she does not order the Hercules and Leo freed because she says that she's a, a lower court and she's bound by what the, the judges had done when they had said you have to be able to have rights and duties in order to be a person. She says, basically, I don't agree with them, but I'm a, I'm, I'm a lower court, which I think in, in civil court that probably wouldn't happen. But common law courts are bound by higher courts, they have, by the interpretation higher, higher courts give. So that's why we, we lose. So. Then we, 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 do, we file suits on behalf of Tommy again and Kiko, and they go back to the judge, and the judge says, again, <laughs> why are you bothering me? Um, uh, you, you, know, you lose because I'm still bound. Also, she says something else, that um, there are certain circumstances in which you cannot file a, a, a second lawsuit, and I think you can't file a second lawsuit. She didn't say that for Hercules and Leo, but she said it for the, when we filed suit on behalf of Tommy and Kiko. So we say, okay, we're now going to appeal to the last of those four courts. So that was in March of 2017. Um, so we file, our, we walk in with our appeal, and the clerk says, you don't have the right to appeal. And we say, not this again. We're not putting up with this again. <laughs> so we then file a motion in front of the court saying, motion to take our appeal as of right. And a single judge, one judge, says, no, you can't appeal. We say, okay, it's getting tedious, but you're wrong. 
So then we, uh, we ask that it be reviewed. And so then five judges then say, she was right, you can't appeal. We say, okay, you're all wrong. So then we try to say, well, we can appeal to the highest court in the state of New York on this issue, but let's try something, one other, frankly, bizarre thing. So there's something in common law called a writ of mandamus. I don't know if you have it in German law. And what that means is if a public official has a non-discretionary thing that they have to do, in other words, it's part of their job as the public official, and they can't, they can't decide not to do it, but they're not doing it. You can go to a court and say, we want you to order that public official to do what she has to, required to do. So we seek a writ of mandamus in the court saying, you're not doing what you have to do, which is take our case, and we demand that you order yourself to follow the law. And that does it, <laughs> believe it or not. They order themselves uh, to follow the law, which, so, so, um, which is you know, really strange, but um, they know that there's been a major screw up in their court in some way. So they call us up and say, um, what we'd like to do is have you take back your petition for mandamus. Here's the money you paid for the filing fee. Uh, and it's gonna, we're going to make it look like we just decided to rule that way spontaneously. So we say, you know, Lewis, we don't want to fight. We put it up on our website so the history will know what happened. But if you look in the court, it looks like they did it spontaneously. So, but... So then we go, this is now I go to March 2017, and the judges come out, and boy, are they in a bad mood. And uh, I don't, and in fact, we thought, I thought this could be happening because NBC News wanted to film, and they had the right to film the, the oral argument, and the judges said no, and we thought that was illegal. But NBC News had the right to appeal that, but we didn't have the right to appeal that. And so they clearly did not want it on what was going on on NBC News. So we then had, all I can say, it was like an intellectual street fight. Um, it, was, it was a nasty, nasty fight. Um, uh, in, to my belief, they were at least implicitly biased against us, and some of them may, ha may have been uh, explicitly biased against us. Uh, and it, it was a nasty thing. So they then issue a, a long decision that says, forget it, you're not, you, know, you, you don't win. And we believe that it's not that the decision's wrong, it's like every sentence of the decision is wrong. So you can go to our website, and we've actually annotated it sentence by sentence, showing that everything they said was wrong, and, and why it was wrong. Like if they say, well, this judge said this, we show that judge didn't say that. That sort of thing. Or here they say X, and here they say not X. We say, well, they're internally inconsistent. So literally, we've annotated, I mean, there are just dozens and dozens of footnotes because it really ticked us off. We don't mind losing, but we do mind losing in a way that's just irrational and arbitrary. But we understand we're going through that phase, um, and we just kind of, ah, okay, well, we're going through that phase, but this one really made us mad. So we actually go into that phase, and we annotate it. So we then try to appeal that to the, to, to the Court of Appeals. By the way, we had tried to appeal the first losses to the High Court, and the High Court had said no. Remember, they only take 3% of the cases. So they had said no, and in fact, it came back in August of 2015, and they issued uh, an order that had about 1,000 cases where they go, all 1,000 of them were no, and our cases were in those 1,000. So we say, okay, well now we have like a 3% chance of having them hear us, but we're going to appeal and we're going to ask them if we can appeal. So what happens then? Now I bring you up to May 8th of, of this year. So in that case, um, the court says on May 8th, we're, we're not going to take your case. But one of the judges, and he now is the first high court judge of any place in the United States, says, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, and he notes, the fact that they didn't take your case does not mean that they agreed with it or disagreed. It just meant they don't want to hear it. But I want to hear it. Basically, because I think you're right. And he says that holding chimpanzees like that is a manifest injustice, that a chimpanzee is not a thing, that a chimpanzee is likely a, likely a person. He chastises his brother and sister judges for not taking the case, saying, look, you can't avoid this forever. You're going ha you know, to have to take, take the, these cases. And all in all, it was a terrific case. And oh, yes, and the really good part was is that he went and, and all these times we kept saying the courts were wrong, 
He agreed. They were all wrong. <laughs> so we go, yay. <laughs> so based upon that now, we're, we'll be bringing another lawsuit in the state of New York. What? I think we've like covered every chimpanzee, so now we're moving on to elephants. Um, now, we, have, we began November of last year filing our first elephant suits. So we have two lawsuits now in the state of Connecticut on behalf of Beulah, Minnie, and Karen, three uh, wild-caught elephants, God help us, uh, Asian and African, who are being forced to, they truck them up and down to go to fairs, and people ride in their back all day. And you can actually see me at a fair where they're this magnificent being, just a magnificent being, is being led around inside in circles all day with screaming people on his back, on her back. It just, you know, I, I'm taking a picture of him. I was like, I was so angry. I spent hours and hours there. I was, I was just so angry as to what I was seeing. Um, and so, because we check out our clients to see, is this all happening? And so a year or two, I had caught up with her and just wanted to see, is she real? One of the three, one of the three elephants. So we filed a lawsuit, started in a whole new, court, whole new state, so they're not bound by New York law, and we run into a judge um, who throws, immediately throws our case out, doesn't issue the writ of habeas corpus, you know, because he says it's frivolous, because it's never been done before. And we say, uh, at one time, nothing had ever been done before, and every time something is done, that's the first time it, it, it was done. We thought that that was kind of a no-brainer. But uh, we were not able to persuade that judge to change his mind. So that is now on, on, on appeal. And it actually caught the eye of the former he president of the Connecticut Bar Association, which is the Association of Lawyers in Connecticut, who also, for 10 years, ran the office that prosecuted lawyers for doing unethical things. And one ethical thing is filing frivolous lawsuits. So he says, wait a minute. He writes, wait a minute, this isn't a frivolous lawsuit at all. And so we call him up and say, you want to tell that to the judge? He said, you bet. So he's actually filed a friend of the court brief in our appeal, telling it to the judge, telling it to the appellate courts. This is not a frivolous lawsuit in, in whole or in part. In fact, he thinks it's a pretty good, pretty good lawsuit. So but th that's his, his opinion. So then remember, you can bring habeas corpus cases again, because again, there's no res judicata. So we thought, let's bring it somewhere else. Maybe we get, so we did. We brought it somewhere else in a place where we didn't have what lawyers call venue. Uh, you have to, the, uh, Connecticut did say where you had to bring the lawsuit. New York said you can bring it anywhere you want, but not Connecticut. But we decided to bring it anywhere we want anyway. And so hoping that the judge would just let it go, but he didn't. The judge in that other place sent it back to the first county of the first judge. We thought, well, it's gonna be assigned back to the first judge. He's gonna do the same thing, and we didn't really gain anything. It turned out he actually, it was actually assigned to a different judge. So that judge has had it for two months. So unless he's writing like, no, really slowly, uh, you know, <laughs> some, you know something, something, you know, is happening. Maybe he's writing no at great length. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't know. Plus, the head of the Connecticut Bar Association filed a supporting affidavit for us saying, it's not a frivolous case. It's not a frivolous case. And so, uh, you, you, you know, go on our website, nonhumanrights.org, and you can follow all the ups and downs and sidewayses of all these things that occur. We also brought in a campaigns director, and so we're, we're also going to start our, take our first look at legislative attempts to get legal rights for non-human animals, but at the municipal level. So we're looking at the city of Los Angeles, the city of San Diego, to see what the chances are and how we might be able to persuade them to give rights to certain species of animals within their city, city limits. And another reason we chose California is if they don't, we, if we, we can afford it, we, have the, we can have a referendum, a citywide referendum, a, a vote on whether or not they, they should do that. So we're looking at that. So the first stage will be city council, will you do this? No. People of Los Angeles, will you do this? No. Then we file a writ, writ of habeas corpus. Now, meanwhile, other lawyers are beginning to do things in other countries. So, uh, the, the, first, the first one uh, was in Argentina. You'll see in the film there's an orangutan named Sandra who appears to have gotten legal rights. Mm, we think not. We don't think that happened. Um, we think they got that right, although you can't change the film. Um, 
And so Sandra's still sitting in the Argentine Zoo, and, uh, we didn't, and it went up and down to all, sideways to all kinds of courts, which we could barely understand. But it seems like when it reached a higher court, the higher court did not say they couldn't, Sandra couldn't have rights, but ruled in some other way and said, we're going we're to look at Sandra's welfare, which is one thing we don't want to do. By the way, courts say to me all the time, well, don't you care about the chimpanzee's welfare? And I say, no, we care about the chimpanzee's rights. And the reason being is that in the United States, welfare is an issue that's traditionally dealt with by legislatures and not courts. And so we're saying, we're saying we care about their rights, not about their welfare. Just as you would if a human being was kidnapped. We wouldn't have a hearing about who's going to treat her better, me or the kidnapper. <laughs> you, you say, hey, you're, you're being detained against your will. And we're saying the same thing's happening with, with the chimpanzees and, and, and the elephants and, and the orcas and any, any other, other non-human animals. However, in November 2016, a chimpanzee named Cecilia was, get, was an, a writ of habeas corpus in Argentina was issued on behalf of her. She was ordered released and she was sent to a sanctuary in Brazil. So uh, that seems to be the first time that that has happened, specifically with respect to a chimpanzee. In all kinds of things going on in India, I was just there in May, because um, we're, we're working with, with a group there. So, in 2014, there was a case called Nagaraja, in which the Supreme Court of India seemed to say that all non-human animals in India have both statutory and constitutional rights. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that, that's what they said. We also are working with, uh, we're working with lawyers in, in Malaysia, I was just in Kuala Lumpur, um, in Korea, in Australia, in, in New Zealand, um, in Israel. Uh, this is the first time anyone in Germany has ever shown any interest in me. Thank you very much. My, my feelings up till now have been really hurt, but now they're starting to feel better. Uh, and so, you know, if there are lawyers who, out there who either individually or we hope you might band together in groups to want to, uh, you know, have, have us come back or talk to us, you know, on Skype or whatever uh, about beginning the process, which we will not will not take the 30 years it took me. As I, as I always tell my students, you know, the first 30 years is really the hardest. And, and then, then it gets uh, easier. But I think, you know, I already put in those dues. I already done, done the 30 years. Uh, and the world's at a different place. So, but but you, need, you need to have a goal, which is legal personhood and fundamental rights that protect the fundamental interests of non-human beings. Then you have to have a strategy that harmonizes with the statutes and the law of your, of your country. Where, or, or your jurisdiction, when you know here under, under the EU as well as under German law, uh, and you have to you know be able to come up with really smart tactics. You have to have smart tactics. You have to have you know a, a, a sound strategy, and you have to have a goal that is unwavering, unwavering. And one goal for us is, I mean, the only goal we have is to get personhood and fundamental rights for non-human animals. And the people who come to us who give us horrible stories about non-human animals being abused and want us to do something. They're, I mean, they're horrible. We just have to say we can't do it. There's a zillion other groups in the United States who might help you. Um, we ha the only thing that we do is that we try to get legal rights for non-human animals. We have, a, we have tactics, we have a strategy, we have a goal, and we've been doing it, and we're going to continue to do it. Okay, I think I'm done for now, so thank you.